Well, welcome everyone. This is our uh, Christian Explored webinar series. We are continuing. My name is Kevin Allen. I'm the Western Regional Director with Christianity Explored. Uh, we are thrilled to have you join us today for a special time uh, as we are going to be having a wonderful um, chat and uh, chance for question and answer uh, with Rebecca Manley Pippert. Becky Pippert is, uh, we've been a big fan of her ministry for years with Christianity Explored and her ministry of, uh, of just helping people see their world um, in, um, as a mission field and to stay salt as we're gonna see today. We're excited to hear more about that. Um, Alan will be introducing and uh, chatting with, uh, with Becky in just a few minutes. Uh, but before we do, let me just introduce Christianity Explored. Um, to some of you who may uh, not be acquainted with us, Christianity Explored came out of um, All Souls Church in London um, just over 25 years ago. And uh, this was a church as is probably best known for uh, being uh, the home church for John Stott. And John Stott was instrumental in getting this ministry of evangelism um, going through uh, people like uh Rico Tice. And so uh, what we try to use is uh, we love to use the scripture to tell, tell the gospel, love to tell, use the gospel to tell the gospel, specifically um, through the gospel of Mark in our Christianity Explored series. Uh, but then we use the whole Bible in our life explored. So we love using scripture and we'd love to do this in a relational environment. And so usually around a meal or a relational environment on Zoom or something right now, we love people to relate, but then be centered on God's God's word. So that's who we are. Uh, we want to help the local church in this. We want to be a part of your own ministry in your church. And so please let us know how we can come beside you um, in this in this ministry. Uh, today we want to thank um, the Good Book Company um, for their sponsoring of this uh, this um, webinar. Um, and uh, they've been very gracious in giving us 10 free copies of, uh, of Becky Pippert's new book, Stay Salt. Uh, so if you fill out a survey, our survey at the end of the webinar, uh, you, we will take a drawing, do a random drawing, and 10 people uh, will have an opportunity to win that. Um, however, you must live in the United States or Canada. We know that there's one Christian Explored staff who's trying to get a free book, and he's over in the UK, and we're not going to give it to him. So um, anyway, we are, uh, if you're a resident of the U.S. and Canada, you can get one of the, the 10 free books. Uh, but for everyone who fills out a survey, you can uh, receive 50% um, off of Stay Salt from the Good Book Company. The goodbook.com will send you a special link and we'll tell you about this with the survey afterwards because you'll forget people tend to close and you lose the coupon code. We want to give you that coupon co code for 50% uh, off of Stay Salt which means you'll get it for $8.50. Um, you can also get the ebook for $7.99 um, from the Good Book Company. Uh, also wanna let you know of um, upcoming webinars. We have one coming up in just a few weeks, in about three weeks. Um, again, it'll be on Thursdays at two o'clock um, Eastern, 11 Pacific. Um, we're gonna bring back a classic, uh, building an evangelistic culture in your church. We're gonna add some new elements to this. Um, we think that this will be beneficial as you're trying to build a ministry of evangelism for the long term in your church. And uh, it keeps us from uh, from discouragement as we uh, uh, realize that this is a, a long time, a long term building project. So uh, please sign up for that. You'll have some opportunities to do that in the weeks ahead. All right. Again, a reminder to fill out the feedback form at the end of the webinar. But for right now, let me pray for us and I'll hand it over to our executive director. Al Navra. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time to uh, be encouraged. Uh, be encouraged by the power of your word. Uh, be encouraged by the fact that you are still drawing men and women, uh, boys and girls to yourself, even in a world that is radically different and radically changing. Uh, that you do not change, our world changes, um, but you do not. And thank you for this time. Uh, with Becky Pippert, and just what a joy it is to uh, spend this time with her. Thank you for her. Bless her ministry, and we pray that we could be an encouragement to her, even as she is to us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Alan, take it away. Well, we do uh, welcome everyone here, and uh, uh, we welcome uh, Rebecca Manley Pippert, Becky Pippert, to be with us, and uh, 
hopefully we can get her video started as she joins us. Becky, can you hear us? Yes. Um, I should. Okay, I'm going to send an ask to start video. So do you see a notification? Please start my video. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. There. All right. There we go. <laughs> Good to go. Hi. Okay, back in uh, 1979, uh, Becky wrote the best-selling uh, evangelistic book, Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. And about 20 years later, she updated it with a revised edition of Out of the Salt Shaker and Into the World. And now just recently through the Good Book Company, she's uh, published a new book called Stay Salt. Uh, she's also published many other books, including some uh, uh, seeker Bible studies. And she's had an impact all over the world, I think in six different continents. And uh, we are just glad to welcome you here with us today, Becky. Thank you so much. It is a delight to be with you, Ellen. Okay, Becky, you are a well-known evangelist who's influenced Christians across generations, across cultures, and across continents to mm -hmm. move beyond their fears and evangelism. But you can start by just telling us something of your story. How did you develop your understanding of evangelism? Well, I think one thing that's really important to know about me is I didn't come from a Christian home. And they weren't hostile to faith, although my dad was an atheist. My mom said there's something up there somewhere. And I was the eldest of three children, um, myself, my brother, my sister. And I became a Christian um, at 18. And that in itself is, is, is quite a story. But I began searching, I began looking. And when I did become a Christian, one of the things I immediately wondered is, how do I reach my family? I, I love my family. How do I do it? Now, that's, again, a very long story, but eventually, and it took a long time, every single one of my family members came to the Lord. But I think I always had a special sensitivity because to evangelism because I wanted so much to be able to uh, help my family. So I became a Christian my senior year of high school, and then I went away to university, and I felt like most Christians that I meet today in my ministry, oh, I'm not an evangelist. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I'm inadequate. And the very first conference, a Christian conference that I ever attended as a brand new Christian was first semester at university. And it was on evangelism. So I was thrilled because I thought, oh, I can deal with all my fears and all my struggles about how to be a witness. And they were wonderful people that were leading this conference, wonderful Christians, but their view of evangelism would be very, very different in how I understand evangelism today. And it was essentially go speak, preach, leave. Uh, don't get too involved. I uh, don't make, make sure they're not going to influence you and just move on as fast as you can. And it was really people are evangelistic projects. I left that conference and I went, oh my gosh, I've got more questions now than I had when I came. And I went, all right, I'm going to do one thing. I'm going to read the gospels and I'm going to look and see what did Jesus do? How did he do it? And I wrote all these notes and I looked at his style, how he depended on the father, how he prayed, how he went out in witness and listened and asked questions and stimulated curiosity and expressed above all else, expressed love and compassion. And I went, okay, that is exactly how I want to be a witness. So I asked God to use me. I kept my door open on that, in, in the dorm, on that floor. I always had my door open and I began reaching out to people very different than me, trying to emulate what I had learned from Jesus and asking him to help me. That's where it began. Okay, so uh, let's fast forward over the years. Uh, you've traveled much. You've talked to tri Christians all over the world. How have you seen the world change, and especially here in the West, since you first wrote Out of the Salt Shaker in 1979? Right. Yeah, that's a very important question because the world has changed dramatically. When I wrote Out of the Salt Shaker, I was in my late 20s. I think I was about 27, okay. <laughs> unbelievable, when I wrote Salt Shaker. And when I compare what culture was like then 
to what it is now, there has been, first thing I would say, a seismic shift in culture. The impact of post-modernity, particularly in the West, um, the collapse of absolute truth, the uh, going from a sense, a common idea that there is a source of authority to personal preference. Um, to uh, picking our beliefs cafeteria style, you know, like, oh, I'll take a little karma here and a little something there. Never mind that those beliefs are totally, might be in conflict with each other. The sexual revolution. I mean, I just mentioned four things and those are absolutely huge. So culture has changed. One of the reasons why I wrote a new book. Second thing, our understanding of evangelism, I think, is quite different. When I wrote Out of the Salt Shaker, again, 40 years ago, the idea was sort of pick a victim, <laughs> you know, go, preach, leave. Uh, the emphasis was, now the, now the strong point here, the emphasis was on truth, but it wasn't on relationship. It was very formulaic. You say it said the same thing to everybody, no matter how different that person was. And I think the best example I could give you of what evangelism was like when I was writing out of the salt shaker is um, I had actually already written the book and I'm in my car and I'm at a, a traffic light. And at the traffic light, I just happened to turn around and I noticed that the woman in the car was looking at me with such intensity. And I first I thought, well, maybe she knows me, but she clearly didn't. And I thought, why is she looking at me that way? The light turned green. I put my foot on the accelerator. The window was rolled down. And all of a sudden, this weighted piece of paper came flying in through the window, hit me on the cheek, and bounced off. And it didn't hurt me, but it stunned me. So I pulled the car over, picked up this piece of paper, unrolled it. And you know what it was? It was a gospel track. And then I realized why she looked at me that way. It was how far do I have to throw this in order to hit her with the gospel? Now, I do not see in the Bible what I would call torpedo evangelism. And what I really was tempted to do was drive up right next to her because she'd moved on and throw her a piece of paper that would, she'd open it and it would say, read my book on evangelism. You need help. Now, that's sort of an extreme example. It really did happen. But that was sort of the approach of evangelism uh, back in the day. And part of what made Out of the Salt Shaker so radical at the time is I was saying, we must communicate truth in the context of relationship. And we looked a lot at Jesus and his style, etc. So the past few, strong on truth, weak on relationship. Today, I would say, besides the cultural change, we're much stronger on the importance of relationship. We're very, very weak on truth, especially any verbal expression. And one of the things I learned, I hear all the time. Now, I've just, my husband and I lived for seven years. We've just come back about two years ago from the UK and Europe, the most secular place on the planet, where we saw an explosion of evangelistic fruit. But I came back and I kept hearing both uh, university students and churches. What I would always hear is they would say, well, this is Christians, as Francis of CC said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. First of all, there is no historical evidence that Francis of CC ever right. said that. Right. But the second thing is, if he did say it, he was wrong. Yeah. What the reason I wrote Stay Salt is because the times have changed and we need to understand, though the message is not, we need to be sensitive to the times. There's cultural change. There's greater hostility than there was 40 years ago, but there's also greater hunger. That, because secularism doesn't have the power to answer and address the longings God has placed in us. He's given every human being a longing for love and for identity and, and, and for belonging. Secularism exacerbates right. our longings. And that is what I wanted to do was try to articulate what I think is the biblical view of evangelism. It's visual. Um, we must 
live the gospel by who we are. In other words, we don't treat people like evangelistic projects. We demonstrate the fruit of the spirit and um, by, by what we do. And that's where justice comes in. And justice is very important. First, it's visual. Second, it's verbal. And that's where we're so weak today. We need to be able to share the glorious gospel. And thirdly, evangelism is invitational. It's calling people to put their trust in the Lord as Savior. I mean, one thing that I've noticed, I like to make a distinction between outreach and evangelism. Mm. And outreach is what we do to make contact with people uh, in our world. And then evangelism is actually sharing the gospel. And I found even as I was doing church planting assessment centers for many years, mm. you know, a lot of people are very excited about outreach, but it's hard to get them to move to the actual verbal proclamation. Exactly. To, uh, share the gospel. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. I, and I, I get asked this a lot. Why don't Christians tell others about Jesus? Why aren't they doing it? And, and I think, at least I can tell you from my travels around the world, and we've been everywhere, uh, I, I hear three things predominantly. The first is, Becky, I really want to share the gospel, but I just can't. And I go, why? And they always say the same thing, because I'm so inadequate. And I go, well, of course you're inadequate. I'm inadequate. Yeah. Isn't that freeing to know? Yeah. But what I always hear that it's not my gift, and I don't have the right personality. Now, when the risen Lord was just about to ascend into heaven, and he commanded us to go, the Great Commission, what did he say? Let me put it this way. What didn't he say? <laughs> He didn't say, go ye therefore, all you extroverts, all you evangelists, okay, and all you Baptists, go and make disciples. The rest of you just hang out, sing some hymns. Uh, why is God's command for every Christian to be witnesses? He doesn't call us to be evangelists. Some have the gift of, of the evangelist. We're all called to be witnesses. Why shouldn't that why does that not intimidate us? Because God's the great evangelist yeah. and he dwells within us through the Holy Spirit. I mean, talk about help. Yeah. It isn't that, that we think, oh, I've got to be the great evangelist. God right. is the great evangelist. And Alan, he does not right. send us out empty handed. He has given us everything we need. The power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the word of God and the gospel, the power of the love of of Jesus. Um, it is so important that we understand that God has given us everything. In fact, it's so important that literally is the, the first section of my book is on the means. What did God do that enables me uh, to go and share the good news? There's another thing I got to say tied to this one, that God, yes, God has given us everything we need. But we also have to understand our weakness is no hindrance to God. God uses us. He is delighted to use us in our weakness. Uh, and you know what the problem is? We don't like that. We want to go in our own strength. That There is no question we couldn't answer. Uh, we have such phenomenal communication skills that, that we can go anywhere. We don't like the fact that God will use us in our weakness. And I love this verse. When Paul says to the risen Christ, I got to get rid of this thorn in the spirit. Please, Lord, get rid of the thorn in the spirit. What is he saying? I can't stand being weak. I don't like it. And what does the Lord say? Paul, I'm not going to take away that thorn in the spirit because my power is made perfect through your weakness. And what does Paul say? Well, all right then. If that's the case, then I am going to glory in my weakness because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. The issue, Ellen, isn't gifts, it's not temperament, it's the power of God who dwells within us. The second thing I always hear about when people say, well, I can't share the gospel, is I don't know the gospel well enough. I think there are several issues here. I think one is we need to understand what the gospel is, and the second part of Stay Salt is the message. Right. The means first, and then the message. But there's another thing, I think, and that is we really lack confidence in the power of the gospel 
And I don't think we fully see the beauty of the gospel and why the gospel makes sense out of the facts of the universe. I was an agnostic before I became a Christian. And when I began to understand what the Christian message was, it answered my questions and it gave wonderful explanation of reality. It fit the facts. Right. Chesterton says that. It's the key, the truth of, of, of Christianity. It's the key that fits the lock. And that is exactly true. Um, the third thing that I hear is, yeah, but I don't even know how to do it. I mean, how would I even raise the topic of faith? And what if they ask me a question I can't answer? Or what if I offend? And so the third section that I dealt with was um, the method, the model, the model of Jesus. How do we learn? How do, how do you even raise the topic of faith? Um, how do you ask questions? How do you listen? How do you engage with people in a sensitive way? Your distinction between outreach and, and uh, the message itself, you know, giving the good news evangelism. So those are the three things I hear, and that's why I based the book on the three common things I always hear. Okay, now even during the time that the uh, book has been launched, we've had a global pandemic <laughs> yeah. in our world. So uh, our world has changed even more yeah. than uh, yeah. what we were addressing then. Uh, how can some of these changes actually help us when it comes to witnessing? And specifically, how would you encourage the Christianity Explored leader in a local church as he or she is trying to equip people in the church to share their faith? Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent question. And one of the things is, let me just say something generally, okay. and that is God has always used catastrophe. And is there any gift? Uh, COVID has been terrible. There's no question yeah. about it. God would use it. And there will be great purposes that he will use. But it, 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 COVID hasn't, it's been very, very difficult. Okay. And but, so what's the gift of catastrophe? It lifts the fog. It, it reveals tremendously important things. And this is where it's so important in the West. Because the West, secularism, post-modernity, post-truth, post-Christian culture, it has not prepared people um, to understand that they're not in charge, uh, that, that they are not in control, that they are not God. And it has really shaken people. Uh, now, let me give you an example. For instance, um, a woman called me right when COVID first struck. And I've never met anybody so confident of her godhood, you know, because she'd always say, oh, Becky, you know, I don't need this crutch. I, I mean, you know, I'm in charge and, I, I, and I'm in charge of, of my universe and, and so are you. Now, I shared the gospel and shared my, my friendship in the gospel. Absolutely no interest whatsoever. She calls me and she said, Becky, I've got to tell you something. I was not prepared to discover that I'm not in charge, that I'm not in control. And of course, the other thing that COVID has done is we've had to face our mortality in ways that we right. in the West always try to diminish it. And she said, Becky, if a, uh, a single organism can bring our planet to a complete halt, what I've realized is I'm not God and I never was. Because if I'm God, we're in trouble. And I said, why do you say that? She said, a great answer. She said, Becky, what kind of God am I if I have to be taking pills for anxiety? That isn't exactly the kind of God I'd want to put my confidence in. That's what I want to say to Christianity Explored leaders, is you need to be, just in your contacts with unbelievers and encouraging um, the ones that are coming to you online and, and, and the different ways we can do it in COVID, whatever way that, that is working. What we need to be able to do with our non-Christian friends is saying, tell me the questions you have now that you didn't have before COVID. Tell me where, where are the struggles? And, and don't think you can't share your own. We need to be authentic, but we also need to communicate where we found peace, why we have hope. This is a tremendous opportunity 
for the gospel. So uh, Rico Tai says also another thing that's happened during COVID is that the walls have come down or the curtains have come down. Yeah. The church can no longer rely on people coming to the church because a lot of times the church is closed. That's so you've right. got to figure out ways to get outside the walls. But yeah, during right. these times of social distancing, how can people you know, get beyond the barriers to actually contact people? Well, and by the way, I wanted to say something here, and that is I love Christianity Explored. Absolutely love it. And uh, Rico is, is just a dear friend. And so we went to All Souls when we lived in London. We lived in three different places, but got to know Rico really well. And it just, I'm just, that's why I'm so honored to be able to do this. And I wanted to say that from the beginning, sorry. So what do we do with the walls coming down? Obviously one, especially when we were in more restricted times, we call our non-Christian friends. We ask genuinely, how are you doing? How can I pray for you? What, what, who, what would you like me to pray for? Um, we, we need to, uh, to get involved and, and to ask them genuine questions. And really, as if the conversation goes well, um, at some point, invite them to do, and we're going to talk about this probably later, but a, a Bible study looking at the person of Jesus. And right. in Christianity Explored, it's the wonderful gospel of Mark. Yeah. But that's one place where we start. And now we're able, now again, I've been in the States now for a while, but we can have people over, um, you know, in our, our back garden. Notice I didn't say backyard. <laughs> backyard in England is a uh, uh, cement. Okay. But we can social distance and, and we're yeah. able to uh, communicate with people that way. I, I'm just curious, what other ideas does um, Rico suggest for how to contact um, believers during COVID? Well, I know Rico uh, in All Souls ran a uh, Christianity Explored course virtually right. recently. And they had people from all over the world joining. Oh, so it fantastic. breaks down, yeah, it, it breaks down geographical barriers. Exactly. So even on this webinar with you, we've got people from uh, uh, all over yeah. who are joining us. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of uh, talks and podcasts and all that around the world. And uh, it's been thrilling. It's been thrilling. And listening to the stories of what Christians are telling me about the openness they're finding right now in unbelievers like I had with my friend. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, uh, in your book, you remind us that Jesus calls us to be fishers of men and not hunters of men. <laughs> Can you explain this imagery and how would this help a Christianity Explored leader engage people from all kinds of different backgrounds? Right. Well, what does a fisher do? You know, a, a fisherman, uh, a fisherwoman, they throw <laughs> out bait. Um, okay. That, and this is where Jesus was so amazing in the way that he could rouse curiosity and ask questions, rouse curiosity. Um, then uh, we, we, we throw out bait, we ask questions, we listen to what's behind the questions. What are their longings? What are their needs? Um, what is it they're looking for? Uh, so that is a, a way to start. And that's what we see Jesus doing too. Okay. Uh, now, and you said we were going to get to this uh, a little bit later, so we'll get to it now. In Stay Salt, you speak about the power of seeker Bible studies using one of the four Gospels. And as you've mentioned, Christianity Explored uses the Gospel of Mark. You also have excellent studies that are published <laughs> by the uh, Good Book Company on the uh, Gospel of Luke and the Gospel yeah. of uh, John. And Rico has found these to be very effective. And why do you think getting unbelievers into one of the four Gospels is so important in the 21st century? Listen, I cannot tell you how powerful it is to get non-Christians exposed to Jesus um, for many reasons. One is they don't understand the Gospel. I'm always having conversations with non-Christians and I'll say, okay, after we go a little ways, I'll say, okay, can you explain to me what you think Christianity is? Rarely have I met anybody that has a clue. 
we are biblically illiterate in 21st century in the West. And so they, and then when they tell me what they think it is, which is always some version of uh, sort of cultural elite academia, it's a, a very distorted view of the Christian faith and of Christians. And what I always say is, well, I'm glad you rejected that. I've rejected too. Because that isn't remotely what Christianity is. Well, what is it? Now, you got a couple ways you can go here. You can certainly do a, a short version of the gospel. But the thing that's so powerful is say, well, look, why don't, let, let's, just, let's just take a look. Let's just look at one story of who Jesus is. How can you make an intelligent decision, much less reject Christianity, if you've never looked at who Jesus is? And I have the impression that you've never actually read the Gospels before. The, 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 you know, you don't have to believe in Jesus. You, you don't have to believe the Bible is the word of God. You don't have to believe anything. But you need to make an intelligent decision. You can't do that without looking. So for the sake of intellectual integrity, why don't we take a look? This is a very effective line, by the way, with students. Yeah. But it's really effective with everybody. Now, what happens? And I'll say to them, look, um, we're going to do a, a, a Bible study. We're going to ask questions on the person of Jesus. And so think of it like a book club. We know that, you know, I know you don't believe in the Bible's word of God. You don't have to, but you're trying to find out what's there. But what do we know? We know the Bible is yeah. a lot more than just a book. Right. It is the power of the word of God. And what happens when you start reading about Jesus? Jesus is irresistible. He is so beautiful. He is so wonderful. He's so exasperating. He is so different than what people think. And when I do the John study, the first thing I start with is John 2, when Jesus comes in and he is so angry, righteous indignation at how the, the leaders, the religious leaders are um, trying to make a buck right. off of faith. They're overcharging uh, pilgrims that are coming right. who, who want to, to get a sacrificial animal. Jesus is so angry. He, he turns the tables upside down. And I do this right. with, with non-Christians and they go, wow. I mean, I don't like religious hypocrisy, but I've never been so mad I trashed a room. I, I didn't know Jesus and I had anything in common. Yeah. Um, when you expose them, you've got the power of the word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power of Jesus. You have so much working for you that, that they don't realize. You know, when I lived in the UK and, and we ministered throughout Europe, I wrote both of those studies when I was um, living there. And the impact that we saw with non-Christians being exposed to Jesus for the first time, I just can't begin to tell you how powerful it is. I've been doing this all through my ministry, and I can't encourage you enough. Bring them into the presence of Jesus and let them see what he was like. Yeah, I think there's a lot about Jesus that we as Christians take for granted. Uh, I, I know a, a Christian explored leader in New England told me about running a Christian Explored course. And about halfway through the course, one of the people, it's just like a light uh, went off in their head, said, wait a minute, Jesus was a real historical person. Yeah, right, right. He's you know, real. You can, spend, you can spend a lot of time arguing for that, but they saw it. They discovered exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. Oh, and one of the things we know from research and in, in particularly this culture yeah. um, is that you know, there was a real uh, famous research thing, Pew and then PEW and then another one that was looking at um, Christians and why particularly younger Christians were hesitant in evangelism. But then the other thing that came out that didn't get reported as much is that non-Christians said, oh no, I'm very open to having a religious dialogue so long as people don't talk down to me. It's dialogical. Um, we are... Um, uh, we're engaging and really connecting as human beings. And another thing that came out was their love of story. Right. So seeker Bible studies actually meets every one of those criterion. The, assuming now we've got a real relationship with, with non-Christians, right. we're real, we're authentic, 
we are exposing Jesus and, and it's through the power of story. It's just, it's a fantastic combination. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've worked with uh, Rick Richardson and yeah. I know he came out with a study recently that shows that unbelievers are much more opening to more open to hearing than most Christians are to sharing. Oh, absolutely. And that's exactly what the research shows yeah. is exactly that is that, um, what, when I lived those seven years based in UK, but traveling throughout Europe, one of the things I saw, at least Dick and I thought we were seeing, and I think it's true is that here we are in a culture that is so, so secular, been secular for so long. And what we began to realize is we were starting to see the back end of secularism. There was far more openness than I ever expected as I talk with non-Christians because they were, um, they had tried a lot of other things and they had been disillusioned and they were open. The problem wasn't the openness of, uh, now I'm not saying everybody's open and I'm not saying it's still not a tough nut to crack, but there was much greater openness than I was led to believe. The problem wasn't their openness. It was the silence of Christians. Okay. And that's why we had to begin by just evangelism training, evangelism right. equipping to help Christians start gaining confidence in the gospel and knowing how to do it. Uh, and then discovering as they led these seeker studies that lo and behold, people were much more open. Just gonna tell you one wonderful story. Okay. When we arrived and um, one of the things we did, my husband and I, is that we were asked by UCCF, which is the, a Christian ministry there, if we would uh, do evangelism training for university students all across the UK. Yeah. And if we would teach them seeker Bible study, that was a brand new idea right. to them. And so that was, we did a big conference that was like, I can't remember. Anyway, it was a very, very large conference for uh, leaders, Christian student leaders. And then we went then to regions across. And I said um, to Dick, I said, you know, this is such a new idea. Um, this idea of doing a seeker Bible study based in an incarnational understanding of witness that I said, it's going to take him a long time. By the end of that first year, Alan, 1,000 seeker Bible studies okay. were begun. And the leader, Richard Cunningham of UCCF said, we've seen more conversions this year than we have in decades. Okay. Now that is not a tool or a technique. That's the power of God. Right. It's the power of God using what he's given us. The gospel, the Lord Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit to help us. Yeah, the power's in the word. Yeah. Okay. And the spirit. Becky, <laughs> yes. Applying the word. Yes. That's right. Okay. Uh, Becky and Stay Salt, you say the gospel is quite simply the best news ever. But there are aspects of the gospel that are especially difficult to communicate, particularly yeah. in today's world. Can yeah. you give us some tips on how to do that? Well, what are the areas that are difficult? Um, probably one of the most difficult is sin because we are taught that sin isn't real. It doesn't exist. Yeah. So what do we have to do when, if we're going to talk about this? Number one, we have to understand sin ourselves. And so the Bible kind of expresses it in essentially two ways. One is um, God's righteous indignation, right. his wrath, right. and uh, that it's legitimate and it's, it's real. Um, the second is, that we, um, it's the problem of idolatry, that, that when we reject God, which is the, the, the reason for the wrath, we also then look for something else. We look for a God substitute. We look for something, and that's, that's an idol. Now, um, I've always said, Tim Keller says this too, that it's been much easier in 21st century culture to talk about the second version to get a better traction than the first. Right. Interestingly enough, I'm starting to see even that become easier, but, but let me go to the second. Okay. So let's say, all right, we're going to talk to someone about uh, why is um, this God, what I call it is a God complex, getting ourselves and God mixed up. So we have this God complex where we, and then we start looking 
for areas to worship right. without consciously recognizing that. Now, you don't just go in and bring that up. You have to listen to the person you're talking to. Where are they? What kind of questions do they have? Well, I, I lived for seven years in, in different places in the UK, but in London, I had a hairdresser who was gay. Really liked him a lot. We really shared our lives together. And he had a lot of respect for me, but said, I don't know. I just can't imagine there is a God. One day I go in uh, to the salon and I looked at him. And I mean, uh, the, the depression and the, the, I just never seen him look so low. And finally, I, I put my hand on his arm and I said, are you going to tell me what's wrong? He said, oh, Becky, I can't believe you're saying this. You were the first client I've had all day who's even looked at me and seen I'm so depressed. He said, you know, I've had a partner for several years and he just left me. And he said, Becky, I'm, I'm probably clinically depressed. I don't know where to go. I am so devastated right. because I worshiped him. And I believe that, that there was nothing that we couldn't solve together. And I right. found a sense of identity and purpose and meaning and love. And he goes, and you're probably gonna tell me that because I'm gay, that's why I'm experiencing this. I said, actually, that wasn't what was coming to my mind. I said, I have a, a, a straight friend who literally just told me the exact same thing. She said she was living with this guy. She worshiped him, said the same thing. And he just broke off with her and is now with someone else. And she is almost suicidal. And I said, what I find so revealing about both of your comments is you both said you worshiped your partner. That's very revealing. He goes, why is that revealing? I said, because you are right to identify we have a worshiping nature. That worshiping nature comes from God. And God has given us um, a... a a nature that longs to worship, that longs to find that love and identity and purpose. I said, everything you told me you're looking for is right. It's God-given. God gives it to everyone. He said, so what's the problem? I said, you've been looking in the wrong place. I said, because no human being can possibly meet these ultimate needs. It's not possible. We're creatures. It's only our creator. He said, you are telling me that the reason for my suffering being this profound is I've been looking in the wrong place. Yeah. I said, exactly. And so have I. I too have looked in the wrong places. I've used God substitutes just like you. And I have suffered just like you. That led into, we'd, I'd already shared the gospel, but that led into a profound conversation right. about the gospel. And he said, Becky, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for loving me enough to speak some truth, but saying it in a way that doesn't lead me to despair, but to hope. Thank you for acknowledging you too share this problem that I'm not alone. Thank you for not sitting on high and condemning me, but walking along my side and telling me. He said, Becky, you've already given me a gospel. You've already given me a Bible study. <laughs> yeah, I think I gave him uh, looking at the life of Jesus, I think. Yeah. But he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to look. And now I want to tell you something. I am so devastated that I am actually going to, I'm going to resign. And so he said, this is probably our last time. Now there's more to the story. But listen to what he said. All right. When you're talking to somebody and you realize what the problem is, we need to know how to communicate, in this case, sin, in a way in which we identify, in a way in which we also need the right language. I called it a God complex. Right. Now, eventually, I said that's what the Bible calls sin. But, but you've got to say it in a way that people can understand. Now, I tell the story in much more depth than Stay Salt. But there is an example of where when we learn how to share the gospel in a way people can understand, it is good news. It's wonderful news. Okay. Well, thank you very much for responding to uh, my questions. We want to now open it up to uh, participants who've been listening. Uh, for their questions, and I'm going to call on uh, Lauren, our communications manager, to moderate the uh, question and answer time. 
Hello. Hi, Becky. Thanks so much for just everything you shared. So powerful. Hey, just thank I'm you. Learning Eric. so much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> so um, let me look at our questions here. We've got one from Peter. Uh, Peter says, Hi, Becky. I remember reading Salt Shaker back in the early 80s. I think your comment that evangelism today is big on relationship and weak on truth is right on point. I also see this phenomenon in today's Christian music, unfortunately. Can you elaborate a little on what you see as the consequence of this imbalance and what can slash should be done about it? Um, I think, as you say, uh, and as I said, there is an imbalance um, that it's relationship without truth. But I have to start by saying, you're not going to get anywhere, Peter, nor is anyone else, if we don't love people. If we don't have the love of Jesus, the compassion, that's why the gay hairdresser responded as he did. Mm -hmm. Because he had seen, first of all, we had a long relationship. And I had listened many times. I knew his questions. We had a relationship. And he knew that I really cared. I cared enough that I, I explained to him why I felt that he was suffering so much, but said it in a way that where, um, and that's always the, the hard part. How do we uh, identify and love people without um, sacrificing the truth of the gospel? Jesus was radically identified in love and radically different in holiness. And I would say one of the problems is we tend to do one or the other. We're either really good at radically identifying in love uh, mm -hmm. or we're really good at being radically different and we haven't invested in a relationship. And I would say to those who are good at love, if you're really good at love, you're going to let them know the good news. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so that's good. That's, that's where good. I start. That's awesome. Um, Elliot asks what I think on the surface sounds like a pretty basic question, but I think it taps into a, a larger issue. I'm going to assume here that Elliot is not a pastor or a staff member of a church based on the question. So Elliot asks, how should I use or be used by the local church for evangelism? So maybe from a church member point of view, how would you answer that? Okay. How to use, how can I be used with a passion for evangelism in my church? Mm -hmm. I want to say thing, something about this. Um, there's a section at the end of my book where I uh, speak to pastors. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things I always say to pastors, and I know this is a little bit different than what you're asking at first, Elliot, but I say to pastors, evangelism, how do you produce an evangelistic culture in your church? It mm -hmm. always stops, starts at the top. It mm -hmm. starts with a pastor who really is engaged, really wants to see evangelism happening in the church. Second thing is that the pastor doesn't have to be evangelist. And to tell you the truth, we do a lot of pastor training. And uh, one of the things they always say to me is, I'm not an evangelist. That's not what I got at the seminary. And that actually is one of the weaknesses. Well, God's the one that gives the gifts. But I, one of the other concerns I have is, is seminaries need to learn how do we help aspiring pastors to be able to use effective means of evangelism within the church. But one of the things I think you can do is, um, Elliot, you can go to your pastor and say, I have such a passion for evangelism, and I just long to see uh, our church engaged in evangelism in a more significant way. How can I be of help to you, pastor? Is there anything I can do because they need to feel, the pastor needs to feel you're not coming in and judging them, mm -hmm. but you're coming in and asking how to help. Um, this need for evangelism training, I think, is one of the most critical, absolutely mm -hmm. one of the most critical. And I felt so strongly about this, that, that actually we did an evangelism training called Empowered that we filmed in London. Um, Good Book did it. But it is something that can be used by churches to do either uh, in small groups uh, in the church should be perfect for this se season in Zoom, but we need help. Mm -hmm. How do we do personal evangelism? Uh, in fact, let me add just one more thing, Elliot, to your question. I'm expanding your question beyond what you've <laughs> asked, but there's three parts of a strategy for evangelism. The first is personal evangelism. Everybody tends to say, it's not my gift. I don't have the right temperament. I'm inadequate. 
you have to be able to help the average Christian in the pews mm -hmm. in how do we get engaged in personal evangelism. That's why I did Empower. The second level of evangelism is small group. Now this is Alpha, this is Christianity Explored, but the other thing is, um, uh, this is my passion, is doing an in-depth study in the Gospels with your non-Christian friends. Now, Empowered, one of my, the sections or sessions is looking at seeker Bible study and how do we do it. And, and Rico and I have talked about this a lot, that often where a non-Christian is, they may be initially a little shy about um, anything that isn't really interpersonal. And so you could do a seeker study but, you know, just with non-Christians meeting together and looking at Jesus. But the perfect place to go after a seeker study is Christianity Explored. Because mm -hmm. then you're addressing all kinds of questions. The third thing you do, it's personal evangelism, small group. The third is um, evangelistic mission, evangelistic outreach. We are so weak on that in America because we only think of it in, oh, well, we're not going to do arenas. Billy Graham said that wouldn't work today, although, in fact, in some places it is. But how can we do creative evangelistic outreach? Work with your pastor, share the strategy, mm -hmm. share stay salt, and <laughs> uh, uh, take a look at how to serve him. That's great. Great answer. And just a teeny, teeny, tiny little plug <laughs> for Christianity Explored, Elliot. We also love offering uh, training for churches as well. I know Kevin Allen, if you were on screen right now, would just be over the moon about all the opportunities that we can offer. So Absolutely. Um, definitely Absolutely. like reach out, you know, for further stuff. Um, okay. So we have a question both from Mary Ann and from a different Peter that kind of touch on the same thing. So I'm going to kind of summarize their questions. Um, Mary Ann says that Becky, you mentioned that you were the first in your family to become a Christian. Um, so how did you approach sharing the gospel within yeah. your own family? Cause that can be such a tricky environment to do yeah. that. And then Peter on tags that question with how did you do that over the long haul or was it kind of an over the long haul thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. First of all, my sister became a Christian very soon after I did. Mm -hmm. And, and I didn't tell, I, I certainly shared my faith, but she came to Christ so soon. Mm -hmm. um, my, my mother was, uh, that was a little bit more difficult than my father. That took 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then my wow. brother, came to the Lord um, last. Okay, how did I do it? First thing is I realized what your parents are looking at and maybe even old friends that have known you a long time and knew you back in the day when maybe you were, as they say in England, a bit of a lad. <laughs> it's a great expression. <laughs> but it means you, know, you weren't walking a holy life. Um, okay, what they're looking at often is first behavior change. Mm -hmm not, doesn't mean you don't share the gospel, but they've got to see that you're, that there's some difference. Okay. Now my mom, I can remember once, I remember I was 17 when I came to the Lord and I remember my mom saying a little bit tongue in cheek, but she went, I knew Becky had been converted when she offered to do the dishes and it wasn't <laughs> her turn, <laughs> you know, but that's a little clue, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I also, prayer is so critical. I pray that God would bring uh, people, peers into their lives mm -hmm. that would um, be able to witness to them, which he did. Another thing is that I, 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 it took me a while before I realized that my parents were secretly afraid that I was really condemning them, critical of them, not condemning, but critical mm -hmm. because I hadn't been raised in faith. And so when I realized that, I began to realize I really needed to affirm them. And so I remember saying to my dad, who wasn't, oh, he's wonderful, absolutely wonderful man. He's with the Lord now. But, but he wasn't, didn't express his emotions a lot. And I said to my dad, you know, dad, I want to, I just am so grateful that God gave you to me as my father. Because I think one of the reasons why I was able to and believe in an invisible father in heaven mm -hmm. is because my earthly father was so wonderful. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I got tears in his eyes, yeah. but he realized I wasn't condemning them. I was affirming them. Mm -hmm. And, and so those would be some ways. Um, mm -hmm. I, I certainly shared the gospel at the right time in the right place, but I think they just knew I loved them. 
and uh, longed, I did long to see them know the Lord. They certainly knew that, but you've got to be patient. It takes time. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Um, I want to just answer Kelly's question really quick. Yes, this is going to be taped later and we'll have this on our, um, posted on our YouTube channel either tonight or tomorrow morning. So be on the lookout for that. Um, okay, I think we have like a couple of minutes, so I'll just okay. ask one more question here. Um, this one, it, oh, okay, sorry, we had a couple. <laughs> just come here right at the end. Um, sorry, let me, okay. Okay, um, so Andrew asks an in, um, interesting question here at the end, so we'll just finish with this. Um, unless you have a few minutes to stay on, I don't want to take more of your time, but... Okay. Okay, um, so Andrew asks, I'm currently walking through uncovering the life of Jesus with a couple of non-Christian friends, so thankful for it. Um, however, for one of them, they're having trouble personalizing Christ's sacrifice for them. Can you give some comments on the process of non-Christians coming to faith? What would you suggest next? Okay, so we just, I just want to make sure I've got the question. Is she asking, how do you explain the cross uh, or what is the process? I think what? what Andrew's asking, I think he's kind of laying out the process that this non-Christian has gone through. Of, okay, they've looked at the life of Jesus. They know the facts of maybe the crucifixion, the facts of Christianity, but they're having trouble personalizing that to their lives. Ah, so okay. can you comment on yeah. that process maybe? Yeah, and then I will say a couple of things at the end. Sure. That's okay. All right. Of course. First of all, <laughs> um, when you're doing a seeker study, seeker Bible study, and uh, uncovering the life of Jesus, is what I did in Luke. Um, Discovering the real Jesus, I think, is the title, and I did that in John. Often, I, I've done seeker studies one to one. My favorite, but you can do it on either either way. You can do it with a few non Christians. You can do it with, I'd say, maybe not any more than six or seven non Christians. That's getting uh, just because you want everybody to respond. If you do a group, do it, find a co leader who's a Christian, and I, I talk about that in the book. You can see why that is helpful. Okay. So you do the seeker study, you invite them to come. And then when I finish with the study, what I will often say is, all right, we've looked at Jesus, but how does Jesus fit in to the big picture? I say, is it all right with you if I explain just what is the essence of the Christian message? And they go, yes. So very quickly, I do the gospel, creation, fall, redemption, return. Uh, um, a resurrection return. But I explain that and, and how Jesus is actually part of God's plan in the bigger sense of the gospel. Then I say, each one of you, you know, will stand before God and God is, you know, he loves you and it, uh, is seeking you. But would it be all right if I explained, how do you make this your own? You see, when they're doing a seeker study, they're not going to figure out how do you invite Christ into your life. Mm -hmm. That's something you need to share. And I did that almost always, explain the gospel and how to become a Christian at the end of, of a study. So that's um, where I would put that. Um, right, did you have another question or should I? You just share whatever <laughs> you feel you need to on that. So yeah, um, go ahead. Okay, um, what have I learned in all the years I've been doing this? Um, I think one of the things I've learned is evangelism is easier than we think. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because God loves the lost and he's actively, constantly pursuing them. The Holy Spirit is at work and that's why prayer is so critical because we have to say, Lord, show me who in my life are you seeking and help me to connect. And you're not gonna know right away who's open and who isn't, but you need to throw out the bait you need to get to know them sincerely, authentically. You need to get engaged in real um, conversations, finding out where they're coming from, finding out their point of resistance, um, finding out who they are and what they're looking for, and then engaging in spiritual conversations and inviting them. And one thing I'd say, invite them as soon as you can into a seeker Bible study. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to wait for months and months. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you when. But I would say do it as soon as you can because nothing is more powerful mm -hmm. than getting to know Jesus. So yeah. that's the first thing. It's easier than we think because God is pursuing them. It's also easier than we think because we have longings. 
We have needs. We have heartbreaks. Don't judge the book by the cover. People are always hiding. And so we need to, um, as we authentically relate to people, doing things with them socially, not just saying, well, unless you come to a Bible study, I won't go to a film with you. We have real relationships with people. But God is at work, and people are far hungrier. They're looking for something they can't quite articulate, but it's there. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to say is evangelism is harder than we usually real assume at first. Why? We have an enemy. And he will do anything in his power to uh, try to diminish our faith, to try and scare us to death. And so we've got to be ready. We have to know we have an enemy. We have to know that, that uh, he, he doesn't want to lose control of, of some of the people he loves. And the very first chapter in my book, Stay Salt, I talk about what happened to me when uh, I led my first Bible study for non-Christians. Because what happened in that, remember I told you I read about Jesus. I thought, okay, Lord, help me. I want to I wanna interact the way you do. And sure enough, I got to know non-Christians. They began asking me a lot of questions. And then to my shock, three women came on my dorm floor and said, Becky, I really want you uh, to lead us in a Bible study because the, you've just, the way we've talked about faith makes us so curious. And I went, oh, I couldn't possibly. I couldn't, I'm a brand new Christian. I mean, I'm just getting to know the Bible myself. I couldn't do it. i so ashamed. I turned them down three times. And they kept after me. And finally, I said, all right, but it's not going to be very good. <laughs> and what do you think happened? I, now, I mean, it really, I really was a terrible Bible study leader. I had no idea what I was doing. But I knew you should go to the Gospels, you know. And, I, and so we did a study. I could see that God was at work. After the third study, it started growing a little bit. After the third study, suddenly in my dorm, everybody heard the same thing on the PA. Will Becky Manley, that was my main name, will <laughs> Becky Manley please come to the office of the administrator immediately? And I thought, that's weird. And everybody heard it. So I went downstairs, went to her. Long story short, she demanded that I stop leading the seeker study. <laughs> well, she didn't call it the seeker study. But she said, uh, we do not do this in, in, in the dorm. It's against the rules. And then she kept raising it up a notch. We have the power, and essentially, to kick you out of the university. I am 18 years old. I'm the only Christian in my family. And I am being told that I might be kicked out of the university because, and I kept thinking about my dad and going, oh, how am I going to tell my father? He doesn't even believe in God. And I'm kicked <laughs> out the first semester. Well, it's quite a story what happened. But what happened in that meeting is that I turned to the Lord and I said, Oh, God, you've got to help me. I am terrified. I don't know what to say to her. And it was just, I mean, the words came. Mm -hmm. And it was, I said, you know, I really, I, I respect this university. I love this university. But I said, I have to tell you that how can I not speak of what I know to be true? And uh, if I am violating rules that I didn't know about, I guess you're going to have to show me that I, I can't stop the study. And she said, I'm very sorry to hear you say that, Becky, because I'm taking this now to a higher level. Um, too long to tell you what happened, but this was in the 60s, at the end of the 60s in America, mm -hmm. where it was student revolution everywhere. And uh, it was like, you know, don't trust anybody over 30. And it, yeah, it was just really, re I mean, it was really revolution. I go to the next study, literally the very next week. I go to the next study to lead it, and I came out of my room, and I walked across the hall, and the, the hall was just completely packed with students. And I said, oh, excuse me, I, I've got to get through. I have to go to that room. And they went, well, that's where we're trying to go, but we can't because the room's full. And I said, wow, oh, you must be talking to a different <laughs> room. Please don't tell me it's my Bible study. And they went, yeah, we wanted to go. And I, they let me through. I looked in. And it was like 13 people in the Bible study, much less everybody in the hall. Guess what had happened? What happened was, as the woman, the, the administrator, was trying to shut down a student-led activity, mm -hmm. um, the news got out like wildfire. 
And that was the one thing you could never do in the end of the 60s. You couldn't possibly do something that was uh, anti-student um, and trying to you know, a, a, a push your authority and your power. We went to something like, I don't know, 25, 30 people in that Bible study. We had to find a room wow. where everybody could meet. Now, the issue wasn't, oh, I can't wait to find out about Jesus. You know? uh, they came because they were sticking it to the university. <laughs> they came and some were mm -hmm. converted. But what mm -hmm. did I learn from that? It's easier than I thought, and it's harder than I ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And it's okay, because God is in control. Let him wow. use you. Mm -hmm. Amen. That is so good. Thank you so, so much, Becky. I'm going to ask Kevin and Alan to join us back on here as we close. Um, Alan, there we go. Yeah, wow. Yeah, Becky, let me just, I know let, so good. I wish we could all. I wish we could all clap. I know. Um, but uh, thank yeah. you, Becky. Um, all the people who are muted, they are clapping right now. Yeah, Becky, yeah, you're such it. an encouragement, a friend to to this ministry, and we want to be a friend, of course, to to you. And um, we want to encourage people to go to Becky Pippert. Uh, dot com is it or dot org? I want to make sure I get this right. Dot org. Becky Pippert. Dot org. org. And uh, check out. There's some great resources on there. Uh, what a great um, opportunity to follow up with more stuff here. We would also want to give you a chance to follow up uh, with those of us with Christianity Explored. Uh, if you fill out the survey afterwards, yes, you will have an opportunity to get that very book that Becky's this holding up. Right here. Hey, Salt. We are giving away 10 copies. Um, oh, yeah. If you fill out the survey, your odds are pretty good. There's 35 people in the room right now. We're you have a one in three chance. And if you don't win and you follow the survey, we're giving it to you at half off through our friends at the Good Book Company. Thank you to the Good Book Company for that. Um, also, this upcoming event in three weeks on um, October 1st, we're bringing back a classic webinar that will be live and be fresh, um, but building an evangelistic culture in your church. And uh, we're going to share with you some best practices. It'll be a very highly practical one. Looking forward to to that time as well. Um, also, just want to remind you and, and maybe tell you for the first time that Christian Explored USA is a nonprofit ministry. Now, it might surprise a lot of you that um, we don't have a lot of churches um, that support Christianity Explored. We kind of fall in that gully um, in church budgets. They love to give to local mercy outreach. They love to give to international evangelism. <laughs> But local evangelism does not exist in the mind of the church for some reason. Sometimes when it comes uh -huh. to budgets, we need your help. Um, so yes. uh, come beside us with Christianity Explored. Uh, ChristianityExplored.org slash donate. We'll have a link for that in our chat box as well. But um, also we'd love just to talk to you about how you can partner with us beyond giving. We would just want to have you partner with us in building the ministry in the church. And we would love to help you uh, come beside us. So please uh, help us with that. Right. Um, and then um, finally, as we are um, closing this time, I'd love to have Alan um, close our session in prayer. Well, again, Becky, I would just like to thank you for being with us. And I would like to thank all the people who joined the webinar. Let us pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would give us boldness and that you would give us words to say and that you would give us confidence through your word and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would uh, guide uh, Beth, Becky and Dick in their continuing ministry of uh, equipping churches around the world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks Thank so you. Much. One, one quick note. A, a question came up. Someone said free book is only for those in the U.S. No, if you're in Canada, US we will send Canada. you the free book as well. Yeah, yeah U.S. and Canada. But, but if you're in New Zealand, we're not sending it to you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <So> mean. <laughs> Okay, thank thanks for coming. So much. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Bless you. Bye bye. bye. bye.